Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about everything and anything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, intuitive counselor, and above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on the quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What is life all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. So sit back, relax and enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Today's episode is somewhat quirky, (laughs) quantum to quantum, so to speak, and at the same time quite profound in terms of the topic we will explore and its importance in our lives. We might have a lot of fun along the way (laughs) with my guest as we take you on this quantum journey, but I invite you to listen closely to our conversation and don't miss a thing. We all want to change something in our life at some point, And change is, at the same time, both liberating and scary. It's hard to let go of the status quo, but if that's not what we want, change is the only answer, and so we must move on. An interesting aspect of change is that, whether it makes things worse or better, whether it brings something new or takes away something old, even if you recreate your old surroundings with vintage stuff and antiques, the vector of change is always pointing forward. You can't go back with a change. Now, we won't be giving you the classic traditional coaching tips here, how to improve your life and embrace the change. We are going to take it to the quantum level, as you would expect me to do on this podcast. And we will tell you how to shift your reality to another one or to change your reality by doing quantum jumps. My special guest today is Cynthia Sue Larson. Cynthia is the best-selling author of several books, including Quantum Jumps, Reality Shifts, and High Energy Money. She has a degree in physics from UC Berkeley, an MBA degree, a Doctor of Divinity, and a second-degree black belt in the Korean martial art Kuk Sul Won. Cynthia is the founder of Reality Shifters, first president of the International Mandela Effect Conference, managing director of Foundations of Mind, and creator and host of Living the Quantum Dream podcast. She has been featured in numerous shows, including Gaia, The History Channel, Coast to Coast AM, One World with Deepak Chopra, and BBC. Cynthia reminds us to ask in every situation, how good can it get? And now, Cynthia joins me from Berkeley, California. Hello, Cynthia. Welcome to Quantum Living. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. You must feel very much like at home. Yes. (laughs) And gosh, this will be a fascinating conversation, quantum to quantum. I can't wait. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it too. Lovely. To set the scene for this conversation, could you please share your personal story that has led you to this point? Well, it's a long journey. So the short version is that I was <laughs> quite young as a child, remembering basically sort of a feeling of consciousness before being born with a high sense of sensitivity, very mystical child. In other words, sensitive to the way that my thoughts were seemed to be interacting with the physical world. And when I spoke of this first to my mother, mentioning, look, mom, when I watch the rain outside, I can think stop and it stops. I think start and it starts. 
And she, um, I should have noticed from her state of mind that this might not go over so well. Uh, it was working fine when it was just me and the rain. But then once I told my mother about this, and I'm sure it sounded crazy, she had that sort of uh, look of like, okay, I'll take a look at this. <laughs> but she wasn't really thrilled and she wasn't expecting it would work. And then sure enough, it didn't. Um, but long story short, I didn't really give up on that sense that there's this tremendous phenomenal interaction always occurring. Mm -hmm. And I had a number of other uh, experiences throughout life. Then when I had a Kundalini awakening, which is basically just all of the chakras and energy centers opening up, of being experience of being flooded with energy uh, that felt like I was lit up like a Christmas tree. Mm. And then suddenly I was extremely psychokinetic. So any passing thought seemed to be instantly manifesting in forms of synchronicity, not to mention if I was not grounded and energized and entered a room, there'd be a series of um, failures of devices like lights, um, machines like the washing machine, the dishwasher, just boom, 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 things would just <laughs> fail. So I quickly had to learn this is real. <laughs> I need to stay grounded. And with my background in physics, um, basically, because I had the Kundalini awakening after I'd gotten the physics degree and I'd worked for a number of years in the banking financial world as a project manager on the mm -hmm. fast track to the vice presidency and doing great um, because mystical abilities are quite well suited to the business world <laughs> because you, you you can tell what's going on. But anyway, long story short, I after the Kundalini awakening, I was no longer working at Citibank, which is the bank I was working at. And mm -hmm. I... I really felt uh, compelled. I felt an awakening um, awareness. That was 1994. Mm -hmm. And I felt that I needed to do something with this, uh, even though it was kind of awkward to write about a topic like this before it was very popular to do so. So it took me mm -hmm. about five years to incorporate the Kundalini awakening. Mm -hmm. By 1999, I started a website to describe what I called reality shifts, what I was noticing that are quite real phenomena that are happening around the world, not just in Berkeley, California, mm -hmm. but it's a widespread phenomenon. And I began publishing firsthand reports that are archived on realityshifters.com, the website where I've been updating every month reports from around the world of these, what we now might call the Mandela effect, quantum jumps, reality shifts, different words to indicate something similar is going on there's a big possible effect between what we're thinking how we're feeling and then the physical reality that we experience mm, beautiful as a springboard to this somewhat difficult or complex topic i'd like to quote a paragraph from your website uh, titled reality shifters where you describe as the new science of instantaneous transformation and then you say, the dawn of this new quantum age presents you with a radical new paradigm that you are not your body or your situation, but instead you are pure energy, pure consciousness. You exist in an interconnected holographic multiverse in which you are literally jumping from one parallel universe to another with every choice you make. Through such quantum jumps, in a moment, you can become smarter, more confident, happier, more outgoing, more effective, in better relationships, with more willpower. You can gain practical tools to achieve real change in your life and leap forward to become happier and more prosperous, living the life of your dreams. So let's unpack this. We are dealing here with quantum jumps on at least two different levels, instantaneous shifts of our reality when we literally jump to a parallel universe or timeline and creating a new timeline, thus new, new reality that unfolds over time as a transformation with our new decisions and different choices, such as improving our relationships, which normally doesn't happen overnight. Is this correct from your perspective? Could you please speak to this duality and give us a few examples, including everyday reality shifts and the miraculous ones, as I feel that this is fundamental to our understanding of the concept of quantum gems? 
Yes, it is a big topic. Uh, so I think uh, it's, <laughs> there are at least a couple of factors to unpack. And when you mentioned the instantaneous portion of it, that that's nice because then we can eliminate the time factor and we can say, okay, ignore time. Let's just take a look at what it feels like to go instantly from one reality to another. And the times that people typically experience that would be life-threatening experiences. And I've received um, dozens of such case stories, firsthand reports from people who were literally about to be hit by an oncoming vehicle, often a huge vehicle, and there was no escape, no place to go. Um, Even if they were in their own car, Mm -hmm. there was just no escape. It was was about to be the end, and they knew that. Uh, And then this turns out to be a much more common experience than I had realized until I started talking about it publicly. And I would get flooded with people with their own firsthand reports like this of an instantaneous quantum jump. One minute, what it felt like is they're looking at face-to-face with a vehicle that just came out of nowhere. They might have been on a winding mountain road that was a bit narrow. They they make a turn, and then next thing they know, there's a Mm -hmm. speeding, huge vehicle coming right at them. There's literally nowhere to go. And the next thing they know, somehow, it's kind of like they freak out. They Often they close their eyes, or they just feel like there's a cloud of dust in the way. Uh, Very often, it's not clear vision. And then they're past each other, impossibly. The large vehicle, the truck, is behind them, and they're going opposite directions, wow. and there was no word to pass. It was not not just a matter of being too narrow. It was literally like a one-lane road. There was no place to go at all. And I've just heard this story so many times uh, from people that would usually whisper it to me, like, okay, what you talked about, Cynthia, that happened to <laughs> me. <laughs> and uh. that one has not yet, knock wood, I don't really want to experience that, but that has not yet happened to me. Mm-hmm. But I believe the people that have told me about it because it it's so earth-shaking for them. And it's a perfect example of an instantaneous kind of a quantum jump where one moment it, you're in one reality, literally. And because you need to, in order to exist, you would require that there be something like a quantum jump, something like what some people might call a miracle. And it instantly seems to happen. And there is an analogous situation within quantum physics where they've done experiments and two particles can be heading straight at each other and then literally move past each other. Um, Quantum tunneling is, is definitely a part of quantum physics. We don't expect that this would be happening at the macroscopic scale yet. Mm. I've got lots of evidence to suggest that it does uh, from people that I believe in their experiences. So so that's the instantaneous kind of shocking one. It is possible also to have instantaneous quantum jumps that are not quite so uh, life or death. And for Mm -hmm. that variety, some of the ones that I've experienced would be having run out of a food item, I think a spectacular occurrence was I was, I didn't have any milk in the refrigerator and I had guests over and I was talking to my friend and she and I were standing next to the refrigerator. I had just checked it, but we both knew there was no milk in the refrigerator and like, wow, these kids drink a lot of milk and it would have been nice if I bought some more, but I didn't. And we were talking and I heard a thump inside the refrigerator. We looked at each other and I opened the refrigerator and I mean, you know what I'm talking about, talking about quantum jumps. Next thing I know, it is definitely um, a container of, a fresh container of milk. It's sort of like we're talking (laughs) about it and thump, delivered, like inside the refrigerator. (laughs) I've never had that happen where I've heard something go thump, unless something fell over in the refrigerator. But that's not, that's not something that happens. So the whole thing was quite unusual. (laughs) And you knew, and you knew that you did not have milk. I knew that at that point. And I'd have to explain what the thump was anyway. I mean, that's not something that happens with our. I don't know about you, but my refrigerator does not have items <laughs> randomly jumping inside. Yeah. No. Oh. I, oh, we get earthquakes here, but even <laughs> so, no. <laughs> Wow. 
Okay, beautiful example. So let's focus in this conversation on the instantaneous reality shifts. As I guess they are much more exciting and less and also less understood than transformation over time. So let's talk about instant shifting to a parallel universe or a parallel timeline. And I will also ask you to to address if there is any difference between the two. Can we consciously choose which parallel universe we want to jump to? And if so, how can we make the choice? Yeah, that's a great question. Big one. And it's you're right. It's not it's not a simple one. It, it sounds simple, but um, can we? Probably. I know that's a little nebulous. I've mm-hmm. I've seen many people succeed at that, myself included. And um, what are the success factors? I would say that's very important <laughs> to take a look at. What does it require? Because yeah. I think some people think, well, if it's possible, then just show me the steps. And you know, and and I do practice martial arts, as you mentioned in the introduction. Mm-hmm, I think there mm-hmm. there's something interesting because a lot of people that I see start martial arts might desire um, in the first week or maybe the first month. Now I can start doing that black belt stuff, and um, probably that's not realistic for most people. Even if they've been an athlete, even if they've done another martial art, just because some things take a certain degree of internal practice, um, bringing together mind, mm-hmm. body, and spirit. Something similar yeah. is going on with quantum jumping. So it does require a level of uh, self-awareness so that what you're intending actually is well aligned with what you love and what you really need. And if it isn't, then the, the odds of success of getting exactly what you're visualizing might not be that good. But um, having said all that, is it possible? Absolutely. And an, an example of that it's like calling in an adjacent reality is what it might feel like. Like (laughs) I was once, um, I've got this example in my book, Quantum Jumps. And my friend Susan had phoned me after she'd moved to Southern California. And she, she was feeling a little sad. She said, well, I've got this new job lined up and I'm due to start soon, but something terrible happened. And I said, what? She said, well, I had an accident. I was, you know, I was camping and we were, I was, I guess she'd had a couple of drinks. I don't know, alcoholic beverages. And then she was jumping from boulder to boulder. So don't try this on your own. (laughs) You know, I think that sounds crazy. Well, sure enough, she broke her leg um, in the camping trip. And so she had not yet started the new job, did not have health coverage, and was feeling terrible about the whole thing. But on the phone, I'm talking to Susan. And I said, well, Susan, do you remember that time we had lunch? together and you were looking at me because I was surreptitiously secretly kind of quietly holding my hand over my arm she said yes you'd cut yourself and I said yeah I know you noticed that but I was hoping you didn't because I thought if I just cover it and I know I need it to heal I can take my hand away it'll be better but it did work you know after that thing with my mom in the rain now I know okay not everybody's open to these things so if you're doing a participatory quantum jump or reality shift you want your team so yeah. and and when i saw that it worked um then she was she said how did you do that and i said remember that that happened i said we i think it's the same thing with a broken leg susan and she said yeah i do remember that and because she'd seen it with her own eyes that helped because now she's on she's on board with me and we're both going to give this a go go for an instantaneous uh. well we didn't i don't ever judge what kind of a quantum jump it is could be instant might take a while what happened long story short i'll speed it up (laughs) because this could go on for a while we were talking quite a while but i uh, after that little conversation yeah relaxed her to realize okay this is possible for her she thought she realized maybe this could happen and i said okay let's let's just feel how much we love your leg let's picture it healed us in other words we're bringing that healthy reality closer so it's just feeling closer and closer. And she could really feel it. Like, yeah, I do love my leg. I would love to have it be better. And then she said, then she was gasped. And she said, Cynthia, it's starting to itch. It feels itchy on the inside. And I said, that is really good. And sure enough, um, then it, it did recover, which created a whole nest of other problems. Because, um, well, it's, it's hard to explain. But, you know, when you've seen a doctor and they said, you have a broken leg and then you don't. Well, it looks like what's going on here. Yeah. <laughs> so, but aside from that, it, 
But the point was, never mind that they'd done the x-rays and it was a broken leg and now it isn't. The point is, she was uh, better so she could start the job and didn't have to take time off from work. Uh, excellent. And in fact, your example with the milk in yes. your fridge, you also create, you also chose a different reality, yes. which in a parallel universe uh, was exactly the same except for it had milk, you had milk in your fridge. Yes. So there was ba- even just one element was different. And because of the emotional intent, because you were having people over and you didn't have the milk, it just manifested. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm loving it. Beautiful. Now, this one, this is a good one. Can we be pushed or pushed another person <laughs> to a Parallel, parallel universe, and that would be really fun. I don't want you in my life anymore. Push <laughs> off, you go into another. Oh, I was wondering, <laughs> wondered what you meant. Like, what does this mean? So you mean t- totally like an ejection yeah, seat? Yeah, in yeah, yeah. You know, they, they joke about it. Like you push the ejection button. <laughs> like, yeah. like, don't say anything else. So we're going to push the button. Uh, I've I've not tried that one, but I have seen people vanish. I know it's weird to say like I've not tried uh-huh. it, but I've seen it. Um, but that's what's happened. I've but these are strangers usually. Uh, I've seen people sometimes walking toward me and then they vanish. Um, that's kind of shocking. It, this happened during a time when I wanted to know what are all the types uh-huh. of reality shifts, and I was feeling. I was feeling trusting with the cosmos, safe to ask that question. Now, you know, as you said in the introduction, I like to ask, yeah. how good can it get? So, of course, I was asking, how good can it get when I see all the different types of yeah. reality shifts there are in the best way possible? So, I'm not asking for disasters um, because I, I do recognize that whatever we ask yeah. for, if we really need it, we can get it. And I, I'm not really seeking drama, but but. But yeah, you can totally, I, I don't know. I've never tried to get rid of a person out of my reality that I knew, not someone close to me. So, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously not that I'm seeking to to do that or would seek to do that, but uh, I guess it was just a, a an interesting and, and funny scenario. I mean, if that's possible. Uh, <laughs> so, but people, please don't try it at home. <laughs> And this, in fact, leads me to my next question when you mentioned those uh, people disappearing. Once we have jumped to another universe, even going back to your example with your milk, you know, no milk and then the milk in the fridge, what happens with our body and our persona in the old reality or the one that we have just left? Do we just disappear, never to be found? And what comes to mind here is the long list of missing persons who disappeared without a trace and evidence of that? Or do we leave behind a clown who continues living on that miserable or whatever yeah. timeline? Well, um, my real view on this is dovetails kind of closely with Dr. Donald Hoffman, who's an expert in the field of visual perception. And he would say, basically, we're, it's like we're living in a simulation. Um, not so much that it's a computer simulation necessarily. We don't need to go there. But it's more like a dream. Like it's it's just mm-hmm. our senses are not showing us what's really out there. They're showing us something, but it's not necessarily real. And so the, what is real is consciousness. It, it's just like we've learned things kind of topsy-turvy, upside down. We've we've been taught, most of us who live in a Western scientific civilization and culture, that only what we measure is real. So Things like love, that's not real. You know, kindness, what's that? You can't measure it. But something that's dimensional, it's got height, width, depth, and length, and weight, and that kind of thing. When you've got specific numbers, well, now we're talking, and this is real. What if that's exactly Mm -hmm. upside down and backwards? What if what's really real is the love and the kindness, the things that you can't measure? And all the measurables are are just... um, they're just sort of epiphenomena of consciousness itself. It sounds crazy, but um, but there are, there are now some physicists who are coming mm-hmm. on board with that increasingly. So it, I think this is what we're going to see as the physics of the future. Although right now it sounds ludicrous, I'm sure, to a lot of people. So what does that mean for your question? Okay, so if we start mm-hmm. with that foundation. Now the question gets really interesting because clearly 
we don't necessarily need to leave behind anything because the thing that we thought was so real wasn't in the first place. The only thing that ever was real was the consciousness. And so what we think we're observing, milk appearing in the refrigerator, just suddenly there it is when we know it wasn't there. Um, that's just an epiphenomenon of the consciousness. So it's kind of like we're, that's why people, I think, go to the computer simulation because they feel like that's the most similar thing they've ever seen. So they can kind of picture it that way. And maybe, maybe it's a good analogy that way that you can imagine it kind of more like a computer simulation. In which case, mm. fortunately, we don't need to be concerned about leaving a shell of a person behind in an unfortunate reality that we just jumped out of. Um, because we chose mm -hmm. through our consciousness, we're now doing this other thing. So we're fully vested, we're involved in the new reality. So what's your take on, as I said, that long list around the world of missing persons who just disappeared without a trace? Is quantum jumps a possible explanation or yeah, what do you think? It is a possible explanation, actually. <laughs> I mean, I can't discount it. And I have seen people walking toward mm -hmm. me vanish. So although, although I don't really? know who they were, they were... I was just walking on one sidewalk. They're walking on another. It's a stranger. I've never seen them. And now they've, they're they gone. So I've seen that a few times, maybe once or twice. Wow. So enough that I've, so to, just to have seen it even once tells me, okay, that can happen. But does that mean that they're gone? I, that might just mean the person was there and now they're somewhere else. Um, but the somewhere else might be completely gone from the physical world that I know. And I have other clues as well because some people have popped into my reality that i know did not exist such as dr yasunori nomura he's a physicist who works at uc berkeley he was featured in the movie particle fever and i went to I, that's where i met him was at the um they were doing a special showing of particle fever at uc berkeley and so uh, i just kept getting intuitive nudges you should go to this you should go to this and i thought i don't want to go see a particle physics movie i don't like particle physics i'm interested in the theoretical physics my guides were just basic my intuition whatever you want to call it just go 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 yeah. and i kept thinking well i'll just ignore it and at the last minute i'm still asking should i go yes like oh brother so with no time to prepare i just jumped in the car <laughs> and off i went and I got to mm -hmm. the campus and I, I thought I'd missed the showing because there was a long line of people. I thought, oh dear, you know, the, the, it's the movie theater's full. There's no way there's no room. But I asked, um, what's this line for? And they said, free beer. I thought, oh, good. So <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I showed up for the free screening with all the physicists there and there were lots of seats left. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but that's where Yasunori Nomura was. And I was so thrilled to see him because when I'd been giving talks, for the Institute of Noetic Sciences at local groups here in the Bay Area. I was frequently citing his research papers, showing pictures from his papers to describe, for example, what it looks like if you look around a corner at a, a chair. You, you never see a smeared out possible chair that's maybe there, maybe not. You either see the chair or you don't see the chair. In other words, he's talking about the stuff that we're talking about right now. And I I love his mm -hmm. work so much, but I had never included it in my book, Quantum Jumps, because he did not exist. Mm -hmm. His papers did not exist. And I was able to, yeah. uh, he said, let's go to tea and talk about this. So we did. And I told him that. Yeah. And he said, may I have a copy of your book? He did not, you know, because he's such a brilliant theoretical physicist. He's worked with Alan Guth, who won that million dollar prize in America for um, looking at the super expansion of the Big Bang um, theory. But going back to people that just popped mm -hmm. into existence, if that can happen, and I know it does, because Dr. Yasunori Nomura was not existing before 2013 for me, and then suddenly, poof, there he is. <clears throat> well, yeah. that's pretty amazing. Because I was doing yeah. research paper searches on exactly the types of papers he was so prolific in. And so... And, and yeah. he, he understood that, like, yeah, you can just pop into reality. Like, thank you, because that happened. <laughs> I'm so sorry I didn't mention you. But I... <laughs> just in time, 
just in time for my book. Yeah, but he wasn't. He didn't. He did not make it into the book. But I talk about him constantly. Even he's he should okay. be in the book, and he would have been. And maybe at some point he will be. Uh, two of my books have quantum jump changed. So if um, one of them is quantum uh-huh. jumps, <clears throat> so who knows? At some point he'll be in it, and I'll be like, oh my gosh, because he wasn't before, <laughs> and that would be cool. I would love it. And I mean, you would say, well, I don't remember writing I, yeah. this. Where did it I'll come so from? I'll be like, thank goodness he's in the book now. <laughs> that, that could happen. So. Yeah. I'd like to go back to um, your uh, your comments about love, compassion, all those emotions, which, as you said, we can't measure. There are people who claim that they can measure the frequency of those emotional states and they actually allocate it somehow certain specific frequencies which then people picked up and you can find them find uh, those audios on youtube you know the frequency of love frequency of compassion etc cetera, etc cetera. what what is your take on that is it just arbitrary you know they pick a frequency that they like or is there some something more to it well, I'm not an expert in those areas, but I, I, I like what they're doing. I, I can't say that there's anything wrong with it from my standpoint. I think it's mm-hmm. wonderful, especially to to d- have a deeper appreciation for these things that I think otherwise might go completely neglected by those who are mm-hmm. very um, right brain oriented. You know, they're, excuse mm-hmm. me, left brain oriented. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. but I like I like what they're doing. Um, I I'm not an expert, so I can't really speak to what they're doing exactly. But having experienced some varieties of, of things, um, like I'll work with some of my clients one on one in a nothingness, silent meditation. We'll actually spend part of the time silent meditating, and they can feel. We can actually tele- telepathically connect on a very deep level, and it's possible to come into coherence in some of these beautiful states of just going deeper and deeper into stillness where there's no change. Mm -hmm. And at that point, there's no time. And so you're kind of outside of this idea of um, finite um, physicality. Mm -hmm. And instead you enter into infinite eternity. And, And even within there, within that experience, there can be dimensions of reverence and love and these qualities. So it's quite interesting to give that, some consideration as well. And I don't know if these people who are looking at um, the frequencies are doing that. I am familiar slightly with HeartMath Institute. And of of course, they're doing wonderful work with the the Heart Energy Center and the electromagnetic field around that. So there's quite a bit of good ongoing research and work in those areas. Absolutely. I think that it is not so much the actual numbers, you know, the in Hertz, uh, of f- as a frequency of a particular emotional states that uh, that are important, but we can relate to the concept of a low frequency or low level, low energy emotional states versus high level and high frequency, high energy, because we actually we can feel that when we are depressed, which you know. The, the very name of the state, depressed, meaning you are compressed, you are down. We can feel it. We are down. And the higher we go in changing our emotional state to, say, feeling uh, feeling relaxed, feeling positive, then feeling, uh, feeling compassion, feeling love, we actually can feel being uplifted, like literally physically we're feeling lighter so i think that the scale of low frequency low level heavy emotional states versus light uplifting high energy high frequency that's something that most people can relate to yes and it's because it's just like the other senses of sight and sound there can be such a variety of personal experience within that experience so that's what's and mm. so it is challenging still to do, to bring some kind of a you know satisfactory measurement scale so that mm-hmm. those who yeah. are feeling uh, skeptical about the whole thing would agree with us like they too can feel it I, I can still see some curmudgeonly skeptics saying well 
I'm depressed and I feel nothing. It's like, and we'd be saying like, yes, that's part of this. That's his part of the depression. When it's really bad, it's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and they'd be like, yeah. like I don't believe you. <laughs> like, so it can, it can be challenging. But yeah. but if they're not that skeptical, if they're willing to doubt their own skepticism, then yes, I think you're right. You can definitely bring people yeah. along to, to grudgingly perhaps agree. Yeah, that some feelings definitely do feel better. But yeah. but then I, I I can just hear them saying, but how do you know it's the same for everyone? And of course, we don't. We don't know that. It is still subjective. And that gets to the heart of reality and this whole key to quantum jumping. It really is subjective. It it brings home that point that there may not be the objectivity that we presumed that there was. Absolutely. And even if there was any level of objectivity, in my view, that would defy the the essence of quantum gems because it is a very personal experience. So, yes, we do have so-called consensus reality, which we need in order to function um, in, in this 3D reality. But with uh, phenomena such as the Mandela effect and other similar phenomena, I still believe that the term consensus reality is not quite right and it's very fluid because uh, when you say consensus, meaning consensus for the whole of humanity, people in your country, in your town, in your family, in in your community, so we need to, I think, qualify the word consensus. And, and as we know, this changes. Like, you know, one day is this, the next day, or even the next hour, the next minute is completely something else. And, of course, we also know, you know, especially from our coaching work, uh, we also know that every person has their own reality because we have individual filters through which we process the information coming through. So there are no two people on the planet with exactly the same processing filters. Even if you look and study identical twins, they are different people in spite of having the same exactly DNA. So how do we create our reality? Such a natural process. It's like breathing, but yet it's the key to everything like breathing is too. So it's ongoing it's um Mm -hmm. part of just our experience of time of consciousness itself and the way that we uh, express our identity and in the world just by interacting everything we think everything we do is part of reality creation especially the choices we make so it's 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 just like we're soaking in it so extensively that it's hard to separate it out and see where it's happening (laughs) because we're just doing this Constantly, we're creating a sense mm-hmm. of who we are based on um, the assumptions that we have about who we are, based on feedback we get, and and, so, and that self identity. You might think, well, I'm stuck with that. Um, it, you know, as I do, that's not the case. And amazing things can change within mm. our own identity, and it, uh, it's it's quite extraordinary what's possible. So. Um, I think I've lost the thread of your question. (laughs) Such a big one. I love the way you do that. Just such a simple question. (laughs) How do we create our reality? So as both quantum physics and esoteric knowledge tell us with thought, emotion and intention, which then leads obviously to action and how we exercise those those, uh, elements. But essentially what what I'm driving at is the the quantum phenomenon of a thought being energy, being able to manifest what we want uh, given uh, the right circumstances. Yes. Yeah, there's uh, all of us begin as subconscious creators. So I think we start working at the very low level of just what we need. As we grow up and mature, we rise up kind of like through the chakras, the energy centers, the centers of awareness. And this awareness of self-identity begins to um, contain more levels to it, um, more than we may have started with to begin with. 
And mm-hmm. we get the opportunity thus to start to see ourselves from a higher, like, like looking down and seeing like, ah, oh, this is cute little Anna, or this is cute little Cynthia. And look what they're talking about right now. And, <laughs> and to kind of look down from that point of view <laughs> is to see uh, if you can really do that, then suddenly, wow, you're in a whole new world. Because then um, you, you can try this if people are listening and they feel like they're having an argument with someone, a friend or a loved one or family member. Mm-hmm. This is a fantastic time to try that, to just do jump up and then just see, re- recognize you can see yourself from that higher vantage point. And this yeah. really, this is the physics of it. This is the math of it because Leibniz was the philosopher who first came up with this idea of the perennial philosophy, these levels of consciousness. There's no accident. He's one of the two co-creators of calculus, which has everything to do with mm-hmm. these levels of perception. And so you can take a first order perception of awareness. And then when you bring a second level, second level, higher order, mm-hmm. boom, you've got it. And so when we bring that back to who are we as consciousness, we are levels of consciousness. We are, and this, this is, gets a little trippy. Look, what are levels of energy? Mm-hmm. We don't, we have not really studied that. I don't, not yet. I think we'll be getting into this in the future. Um, with the science and the math of the amplitudehedron and so forth, mm-hmm. but but we don't quite have it yet. Um, in the mm-hmm. meantime, there is something going on with the consciousness, this awareness of self. Where does it come from? What is it? Ah, we do not have the answers. As a mystic, as a, as the spiritual side of me, I can tell you what it feels like, um, but we don't yet have the satisfactory answers that I would feel satisfied with. You can say mm-hmm. vague things like, oh, it's energy. But then where do you get these levels? What does that look like? And don't yeah. have that yet, but it's exciting because it feels like we'll have it in the future, probably. And maybe yeah. never, maybe never fully, but yeah. we're on the trail. It's getting closer. Yeah, there's still so much to discover for us, so much to learn and so much to understand. Uh and and the process of discovery is really exciting because our Consci- our awareness, our perception expands when we find something new, find a new element or or there is a new piece of information and just things can click in and uh, we can take it then to the next level. I've got another question that I would be really interested to have your take on, one of those curious dilemmas. When we know that something is going to happen at a certain time, Say we are planning for something and it's like pretty much all everything is set in place, set in stone, something significant, and it does not happen. Is it because potentially we have inadvertently jumped to a parallel reality which does not have this event at that time? And a good example here is the pandemic. Was the pandemic a global shift to another timeline or a parallel universe? Because I have to say that in my own experience and when I talk to people, it certainly feels like it because it will, it turned people's lives upside down. So when I am wondering about, was that a global shift to another timeline? What do you think? It does feel like it, certainly. <laughs> I can't deny that. I mean, who can deny that? I think most of us had plans for 2020 mm-hmm. that went completely upside down. I raised my hand on that one. <laughs> yeah, like for sure. Mm-hmm. There were things I was planning to do that did not happen. Not that year and maybe never. It, like, like everything got upended. So uh, that's pretty incontestable. But then you might, I think as soon as you s- suggest, well, is it a shift? Then what did it jump from? You know, what? Where the alternatives is what that's where my mind goes instantly. Like, well, that's interesting. So uh, we think we know. We think, well, it, I would be doing this. I would be doing that. Cynthia would, I would have gone to Sweden. There was a fun conference that would have happened there. Sounded like so much fun. <laughs> that didn't happen. Uh, lots of other things would have happened that didn't happen. And at the same time, I am an optimist, which means that I tend to believe that I'm constantly seeing the result of my constant question, how good can it get? And that may sound contradictory. I know it probably does, especially if you hear that I had long COVID in 2020. I did. Um, 
So then you think, okay, mm. you're crazy now. <laughs> like you had long COVID. <laughs> yeah, maybe, <laughs> but crazy in a good way. Because I still felt like there's something good in me having long COVID. I'm learning something. I need this. Even though I had mm. hundreds of symptoms and felt terrible and so forth. Um, and sure enough, mm-hmm. I was able to find a natural way to come out of it. I don't think that's an accident. So I, I feel like with all of us collectively, humanity going through the pandemic, we are, I'm sure, avoiding something much worse. I, and you might think, you've got to be kidding me. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. Mm. I know that we need this. And it's giving us a gift of phenomenal um, strength, magnitude, depth. It's it's giving us something that I don't know what it is exactly. I know what it is for me personally, that I feel like I've gotten some keys to anti-aging basically um, because well, I'm not going to go into the whole thing. It's mm-hmm. too detailed, but the long, yeah. long story short, <laughs> cut to the chase here. The, the, the big gift for me is just recognizing that I can grow older without needing to feel older, that, um, that I can work, work more supportively right. with my body yeah. in ways it, with things I didn't even know it was doing. And I've learned more in a good way about how to, bring tremendous vitality to my my physical being Mm -hmm. uh, in ways that were not taught anywhere and and they're not even easily available there's no way i would have learned it unless i went through that and i have a certainty in the core of my being that uh, collectively as humanity we're going through something similar that there's something we're learning that we need to know and we're going to be if we're smart if we're wise we'll be so grateful that we got this lesson and it's so much better, therefore, than any of the alternatives. Absolutely. Now, Cynthia, you've touched upon this a few moments ago, uh, but I would like to put it in a question. Have you discovered or developed a technique or, or some steps or a strategy anyone could use to jump to a parallel universe instantly <laughs> that you could just I don't know whether whether you are teaching it in in your work with clients or uh, is it somewhere in your books? And if you have, I want it. <laughs> and probably most people would want it. What can we do? Is there anything we can do consciously? Yes. Uh, the main thing people lack is um, well, they lack a couple things. You need to have patience. Lot- <laughs> yeah, patience. <laughs> patience, grasshopper. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. Well, you need the energy, the requisite energy. A lot of people feel low energy for some reason. They um, they don't get enough exercise. They don't do the deep breathing. Maybe they don't eat the correct foods for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. So energy can be a common issue. So you want to make sure that you're getting that energy that you need. A fast track for that is going into gratitude, thankfulness, and then getting all the way up to, into reverence, where you literally look at everything with such eyes of wonderment. Like, wow, it feels like you're looking at heaven everywhere you look. Like everything you see is another facet of the creator, of the divine. Mm. So that's just a shortcut to get to reverence. Um, mm-hmm. it, was given, it sounds simple. It is simple. Is it easy? Maybe not. But it's it's powerful. So to have that level of energy available is essential to make that instant quantum jump. We get that when we're in a life or death situation. I'm sure that's why people are having that experience because then boom, they just feel this rush of Kundalini energy, even if they never had Kundalini before. And they just realize I'm going to die. And then boom, you're fully there. Mm -hmm. Like you've never been there before and totally energized, totally focused. Focus of attention also is important. And so um, for those of us who practice things like martial arts, then you get the benefit of bringing your mind, body, spirit together in a singular point of focus. That's a very powerful thing. So people that don't do that, um, martial arts, I mean, um, you can practice yoga, tai chi, qigong, all of these things combine mind, body, spirit. So anything that feels right for you, give it a try. See if that helps Mm -hmm. um, develop your focus of attention. So for that instant shift, um, the other thing that helps is one, just this open mind. You know, I mentioned my friend Susan and the fact that she'd fortunately witnessed something bizarre when she'd seen me put my hand over a cut and then take my hand away and there's no bleeding. So she'd seen, and then that led her to be open-minded enough 
to have an instant healing of her broken bone where it come and that's what did happen it was instantly healed during our phone call so when she went in to have it checked it was fine but mm -hmm. so this these are the this is the basic core of it just having just the three the high middle and low just grouping chakras together if you just if you focus with full um awareness of this is what you're visualizing and you're completely clear on it from the, your head, you know, from your crown and third eye energy centers, from the middle of yourself, it's totally what you know that you love and you have your full focus on that. And then you bring all that energy to it because you know you really need it. You're not kidding yourself. It's not something that you talk to yourself into. Everyone else is doing it. No, 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 that's not good enough. Needs to be something you really love, need, and are focused on. And then when you've got all that lined up, it's you are capable anyone's capable of having an instantaneous quantum jump beautiful thank you and this actually makes a lot of sense so it is both well quantum knowledge <laughs> and quantum technique, but it is grounded. So I think that people can relate to it. And with practice, just like I guess everything else, we can possibly achieve that on top of various jams that happen without our necessarily strong intentions, such as avoiding an accident or in some other sort of life and death situations. Yes, yeah, so that's that's definitely something worth practicing and i and i feel that when we think about it along the lines that you have just described most people would probably recall certain situations that happen and they would say yeah you know i think that with this you know what what happened i actually feel now that i may have quantum jumped jumped to another reality another timeline so speaking of which, is the parallel universe the same as a parallel timeline or are they different concepts? Uh, well, it's um, they're similar. Uh, different, people use them different ways. Um, you might think that there's agreement even if you talk about a multiverse. There's even among physicists, there are all these different theories of <laughs> multiverses, lots of them. Yeah, so many different versions. And so timelines mean different things to different people i think time is curved if it has a shape at all so it's not really linear much ever, you know hardly ever is it linear but it's it's it looks more like rivers you know uh -huh. sometimes with circles back and eddy currents and then it moves on and wavy shapes <laughs> not so much lines but the possible realities yeah. those can feel differently to different people. To me, when I feel like I'm about ready to jump into something adjacent, often it feels like it's right here. Like I can feel like I've called it so close to me that it's just a simple matter to step into it. It's just like, it's right here. All I have to do is act accordingly yeah. and I'm there. Yeah. And so timelines, um, I, I think people look at it that way when they're thinking in terms of they made a choice or something happened to, often I hear that term when, People refer to the Mandela effect and they feel like like they're in this pandemic and it's not my timeline. This is not my reality. So they don't want to claim it. Like this is not, this is not anything I'm part of, you know. But actually yeah. it's um, you know, maybe it is. So I, I I think we don't want to be too quick to throw the baby out with the bathwater and let's be aware that there could be something. So when some people use timelines, alternate realities could mean something similar. I think that's probably true. For me personally, I, it's I don't see that we're that you know that we've left some part of us behind or that we left something there, but it's more that we are the consciousness. When you identify with that, then you are both the operator in your life and the physical body. You you brought yourself all together. And and you've got that mind body spirit awareness so you can move all of a piece. And whether you call it a timeline or an alternate reality, doesn't really matter, or even a simulation. It's just um, this is now a new experience, and it's life. But it's this new life that wasn't there before, perhaps. And maybe you have proof, or at least you have a memory. Like it wasn't like this a minute ago, but I'm glad that it's this way now. Yes, absolutely. I subscribe to a theory which says that 
a quantum theory, which says that every time we make a decision or make a choice out of multiple options, for example, we create, and if you like, leave behind a, a number of new timelines or new parallel universes with us going on to those other directions or take making those other choices and options. So this would imply that, gosh, by the end of our life, there is a <laughs> very large number of, <laughs> of parallel timelines because every single choice we make, it creates, it sort of branches out and creates those other lifetimes. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I do discuss this in my book, Quantum Jumps. There's a Q&A section, questions and answers at the last chapter. And, and I've got a little picture. It's kind of like a, a draw picture of a tree in, in the illustration. Uh, and it's it, it's um, it also reminds me, your question reminds me of that movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once, where the protagonist is a woman who experiences the ability to jump into possible realities where she has a skill set that she did not have a chance to adopt in the particular life that she has led so far. And I, I've, I've experienced some of that. So a little bit of, um, you know, both of these theories. Uh, one is where you can prune prune the branches on your bonsai tree of your life. I, I, you didn't say prune, but that's the way I talk with some clients about it. Because sometimes you mm -hmm. don't really want to develop certain things. You feel like, okay, I would not wish to experience anything that accumulates bad karma or you know just issues for myself or others. So I'm going to prune yeah. those out. And you can do that. And then with the remaining branches, you can also experience jumps to adopt a skill set that you've definitely not really fully practiced or studied or learned, not in this, not in this mm -hmm. um, reality so far. But yet you can access that. You can just um, with the awareness that you're able to just jump into something as if you already know it, you can do that. And I think we've had a lot of people who were quite gifted at you know renaissance people you know certainly within the renaissance in europe and other places on the earth at different mm -hmm. times people have done this so it's 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 available to all of us to access that ability as well mm, beautiful you have mentioned a few times the mandela effect could you please explain this for those listeners who are, may not be familiar with it Right. It's a relatively new term that came into common usage around 2009, 2010. And it's named after Nelson Mandela. That's why the spelling looks like that. And it was the mm -hmm. awareness of a group of people who were attending a conference who noticed together that they were surprised that Nelson Mandela was alive in 2009 because many of them remembered that he had passed away while he was in prison on Robbins Island in South Africa. And so it was sort of shocking to them. So that's where the term came to be. It, the term itself refers to much more than just what I call the alive again phenomena, which I mentioned in my book, Reality Shifts, first published in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And in that book, I mentioned Larry Hagman being alive again. Um, I'd seen him die. And, um, I didn't personally witness it, but I'd seen all of the fanfare and uh, fan affection and beloved response from the world after he passed away the first time. And then I was surprised and happy to see that he was alive again. And that was in the 1980s. <laughs> so that was actually the first in print version of anybody being alive again. So we don't call it the Hagman effect. Fine with me. It's okay. I think the um, Mandela effect is beautiful because Nelson Mandela, what he represents, what he stands for as a person, very yeah. positive. Okay. In modern daily life, people would run into this phenomenon if they experience things where they're surprised to find out not just a celebrity is alive again, but maybe uh, something is different in a movie or a product that you're quite familiar with. And you know for sure that it used to be a certain way. Um, in America, we've got the Berenstein or Berenstein Bears, and that's a big one for a lot of people. They would pronounce it Berenstein and Berenstein. It's confusing to people. Like, how is it spelled? And some people think it was changed. 
Um, but whenever you research these things, the official history will show um, with the case of Nelson Mandela, he never died when he was in jail. He, Of course not. But how could he have died when he became president of South Africa? There's no way that would have worked. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, that makes sense. And then for movies like Star Wars, people remember that um, Darth Vader said, Luke, I am your father. And that was that booming voice of James Earl Jones, such a rich, deep, resonant voice. Uh, I remember hearing that in the theater when the movie came out. But but that's mm-hmm. not ever what he said. It was only, no, I am your father. Even the actor James Earl Jones says it wrong when he's interviewed. He'll say, Luke, I am your father. Um, that's how confusing it is. So even people who were there, they did the movie, they, they get affected by it. And then products have changed. Um, things on TV have changed. So many things. So it's not just one thing. It's just the experience where a group of people, more than one typically, collectively remember something differently than Mm. um, what was the official history. And this last year, there was a research paper published at the University of Chicago with a couple of researchers asking people to to please draw what they remember of the Monopoly man, for example, the guy who's on the game. And people would draw Mm -hmm. him with a little monocle over his eye. And when they did that, uh, it it was kind of surprising to the researchers that people are collectively misremembering that. And then they would give a selection of visual choices to other participants in the study. So the monocle man, uh, you know, he has the monocle or doesn't have the monocle. On the game, he, he's never had a monocle. But that's what people remember is that he has that little mm-hmm. eyeglass over one eye. So things like that um, were proven to be a genuine misremembering. They're calling it a misremembering by the researchers. I would say it's a mismatched memory because I think to say misremember is to is to be jumping to cause. And I don't think we know the cause that clearly um, for researchers to be, you know, they should be more open-minded, I would suggest. So I think, I think a mismatched mm-hmm. memory is a more accurate portrayal of what was being recognized by the researchers. Um, and I think one of the most striking examples, they had the Fruit of the Loom logo, which is a, company that makes t-shirts and underwear and they've got a collection mm-hmm. of fruit and so the researchers ask people um to first you know sketch what you remember and often people were drawing something in that's not part of the logo and then they the researchers gave multiple choices again like a platter of fruit um a horn of plenty also called a cornucopia which is a little basket behind the fruit and then some and then just the fruit mm-hmm. sitting by itself and so forth and people were overwhelmingly choosing the horn of plenty cornucopia and for what reason that's what the researchers don't know and see i don't think that's misremembering i think it's um you know just mismatched memory that it's the memory does not match the current history that's all so it tells you that there's something you've probably witnessed a quantum jump is what i would suggest and I think that's the interpretation that those of us who follow quantum consciousness would come to appreciate. Yes, thank you for explaining this. I actually am in that group. I remembered, I knew, I remembered that Nelson Mandela died in prison. And I remembered, you know, the the emotional effect, you know, the impact it had on me. So, yes, I am definitely in that. Did you remember his dying or yes, not? Yes, yes, I did. You and did then remember. I yeah. heard about him being alive again when I saw he was, I think, in England on tour in Trafalgar Square. And and it was so confusing to mm. me. And then I got this dual thing of I remembered both. I remembered he died. And then I remembered, I sort of remember he became, I don't really remember he became president of South Africa. It's like, why did I not have that memory? I remember he was yeah. sort of, but I don't remember when it happened. Or I would think there'd be all this celebration. Yeah. I, I'm missing that. So something, and that's another clue to me that I have definitely jumped somewhere <laughs> from a reality where he died to one where he's alive, yeah. um, lived much longer. Or maybe this was a case of overlapping realities. Yes. 
So you remember both. Like That's common for me. I'll do that. with a, Almost yeah. like, you know, they were sort of semi-transparent. Right. And you can see both. Right. And you don't know which one is is real. <laughs> I get future memory too, quite often, where I'll see something uh-huh. that hasn't happened yet, and I'll feel like, but that has. It's it's um it's like be, it's like before you have the deja vu, right. getting it and being certain. It's like a memory for something that hasn't happened yet. So I'm quite I get very clear versions of those, which can be a little confusing. And then I have to use logic to figure out. Okay, there's no way that could have happened yet. But apparently it really is going to happen because it's mm-hmm. so clear, you know, or there's a very strong tendency going in that direction. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's it's all fascinating. And I feel that there is a reason why we are experiencing these sort of phenomena increasingly more and more often. So I don't know, maybe um, so that we can get used to it as we are evolving and then start seeing those realities more clearly and start understanding as we are speaking, yeah. start understanding how does this really work, which is um, yes. yeah, amazing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I know you're, you're onto something there because clearly this is such an important time for us to recognize what better time to fully understand finally that we're capable of doing this, that together collectively, we can move to a reality that's increasingly mm. more positive for all of us, regardless yes. of what things may seem like they, which, yes. which way they're going. Mm. And I think what you said is very important, and that is to approach this with an open mind, to embrace it when we do have those experiences, rather than freaking out or dismissing, to embrace it with an open mind and say, okay, that's my experience. Let me think about it. Let me tune into it. Let me meditate on it. Because this will open up more and more our own um, experiences in this lifetime to other realities, other possibilities, which our mind can't com- even comprehend at this point in time, which is okay. So that's that's very important. Yes. Now, Cynthia, I heard you talk about healing as a quantum mm-hmm. phenomenon, and I agree it is certainly a quantum phenomenon, but I wouldn't necessarily call it quantum jumps to another reality. I feel that the healing takes place on the same timeline, in the same universe, with the quantum power of our thoughts and intention which create the physiological and physical changes in the body with new information for the DNA and the cells. Now, the only exception would be perhaps when someone does shift to to another reality and then comes back. For example, when a gravely ill person, say with cancer, has an NDE, near-death experience, when they literally shift to another dimension of the reality with the with the awareness and then come back fully cured what are your thoughts i've seen so many instantaneous healings um myself and others including my grandmother who had inoperable inoperable liver cancer and that instantaneously mm-hmm. healed uh, she wasn't wishing for that she just wished to have the courage to face whatever came next she'd been given a 3 month to live diagnosis by the doctors and clearly, um, and she didn't even tell those of us in the family until like a, a month had passed because she didn't want to wreck the holidays. Um, so then when uh-huh. she finally did tell us, and and she was such a spiritual person, so many people were praying f- for her full recovery, not just for her to have the courage to face, to face whatever came next. But, you know, we loved her. I loved her, too. And it was clear that she was, I could feel she was experiencing an instantaneous shift, which um, surprised her doctors. And then, like I told you, my friend Susan, her bone was healed on that phone call. When The next day when she went in to have it checked, it was completely healed, not just broken, but healed. And I, and so many other mm-hmm. times I've, for myself, I've seen like the cut that vanished off my arm, burns vanish off my body. Um, it's just Lots of things I've seen instantaneously transformed Mm -hmm. with healing. 
So I know it's possible, just like rain starting and stopping. We might think that we have mm-hmm. to go through a healing phase. What if we don't? I'd say open up the mind to the possibility that there can be instantaneous transformation at any point. And all you really need mm-hmm. ever is just that alignment of the full energized sense of need, like this needs to happen. And the the, the love, mm-hmm. it's a very strong love connection. Sometimes we have trouble loving ourselves. And sometimes that's why we go to a healer or we ask people for help to pray for us because we feel like we're not able for some reason to, to access that full unconditional divine love that's there for each and every one of us. And then maybe we have trouble imagining that that could be possible, holding that vision. Uh, so there are some things that could be problematic and might tend for people to feel like, okay, there needs to be a healing time frame. Maybe so, but I know it's not necessary. Yeah. Anything, anything can heal instantly from what I've seen. Absolutely. And I totally agree with you that healing can be instantaneous. I myself uh, have experienced it many times. I have particular techniques that I use to heal my own body quite effectively. So, you know, to me, this is a no-brainer. And and I think there is sufficient scientific evidence uh, in, in quantum physics, in the work of Dr. Bruce Lipton, about the possibility of instantaneous healing of our body. What my question is, whether when this happens, whether this is due to the power of our thought and intention, which creates changes at the physiological level in our cells, or is it a pure jump into a parallel reality? (laughs) Oh, I see. It's a puzzle. Well, it, I think I would tend toward the simulation conceptualization again. So in other words, are the cells real? They are. They have their own individual consciousness. Mm-hmm. Are they part of us? Uh, yes, they're part of us. Um, but then that's when it's a collective. So the, the the real question is, who am I and who are you? And that's the key to this whole thing, really. It's um, <laughs> yeah. And that's what I don't know. <laughs> I'm saying it because like, how could, I don't... I can tell you what I experience and what I suspect, but I can't be sure exactly mm-hmm. what do you suspect? how to answer that. Um, that we are pure consciousness, and at the same time, we're a collective. So it's like we are all as one, but we have levels of consciousness as well. And within each of ourselves, there are levels of identity. So we, we're we a collective of our own cells, of the systems within our body, and Often there's our subconscious. We don't usually identify with the blood cells or the mitochondria or, you know, not to mention the lungs or the Mm. heart or the skin. So it's hard for us to have that level of empathy. It's just like that's part of my physical body. But um, so it's it's a little challenging Mm. to answer that question. It's And the way that we do the quantum jump matters. There are many methods that are possible. So the reason that so many different techniques can work is because some people might have a deeper um, affinity or a sense of being physically embodied and others don't. And so for someone who really is in that body, then for them, it would be easier perhaps to recognize that that whole body is moving together. And someone who's not so physically attached to their body, they can just do the pure energy thing and like, yeah, it's a body. It's my body now. <laughs> so and I think I definitely am more of the latter type, um, you know, more of an energy person. I tend to see myself as an energy being first and foremost, interestingly. Yeah. And come to think of it, in the end, it doesn't really matter if we can do that, if we can heal ourselves or help heal others instantaneously, whether this is due to the power of our thought and intention or whether we actually do quantum jump to another timeline. It doesn't really matter. No, it doesn't. It is the outcome that we can achieve that really matters. So if we can do it, great. And yes, absolutely. I know that it can be done. It is quite often being done. So yeah, as I said, to me, that's a no-brainer. And I would encourage people to, to open up to this possibility because, as you said, this is accessible and available to everyone. Absolutely. 
much more. And people, I think, if they just get that one message from this whole conversation, that's the key. Absolutely. I have a, just one final question before I ask you to tell us about your books and your services. And this is the question that's been bugging me <laughs> for quite some time. So I don't have the answer to it. So that's why I, I ask various experts. I have an opportunity to speak with to hear what people think about it. And this is in relation to free will and destiny. And the question is this, when we make a choice, are we truly exercising our free will at that moment? Or are we following our predestined blueprint future or destiny, which includes the points of choice with several options, already highlighting the choice we are going to make. So in other words, are our choices truly free will at that point in time, or are we following a predestined choice? <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love these questions. <laughs> That's a good one. Excellent. <laughs> well, I'd like to start just by talking about mm -hmm. my take on free will and destiny. I love the <laughs> subject very much. And it gets into that. Well, it's back again to what we yeah. keep talking about, identity, who are we, and these levels of self. And often when we think free will, the tendency is to think that that's, it's, it's a, I think it's a mistake if we think like, I know who I am and I'm just the Cynthia who thinks about my daily life and so, so on and so forth, but my egoic self, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit of my spiritual self, but maybe not much. So uh, when it comes to free will and destiny, what I like to think of is that the free will is closer to mm -hmm. our what we're capable of consciously comprehending. And what we call destiny is actually us. It, it's, it's still me. Destiny is still me, but it's a level it's, it's sort of like the higher levels of myself who've already made some choices, done some tree pruning, if you will, on my life and said like, okay, we're definitely not going to do these things. It would be a misuse of Cynthia's time in her life. So we're just pruning those out. And so then from my egoic daily life standpoint, uh, from my free will perspective, I might mm -hmm. feel like, hey, something's not letting me go this way or that way. What's going on here? I keep bumping into something. What is this? Is there predestiny? Um, I would say if you want to call it destiny, sure. Or if you want to call it your levels of high self, I've already made some choices here and they can see things that you're not consciously aware of yet. So you're given the ability to work with what you can handle with the levels of consciousness that you con that you currently are operating with. Mm. And for the higher levels, we've made some calls for you. And so, yeah, there's some destiny going on, but don't worry about it. It's a good thing. And it may not look that way when we're down here on earth, because it can look pretty messed up sometimes. And I know that, so it can seem dark, um, but I, I just recommend optimism anyway. Just, it, I totally recommend optimism uh, because I believe that that's, the kind of universe that we're living in, that it's um, anything is possible. So when it comes back to the free will and the destiny, um, don't worry about the destiny. It's there. Um, sometimes you'll notice you're bumping into something. Then you might get the clue like, okay, something's stopping me here. I guess there's something going on. Oh, and that's okay. Find, find a way to go with the flow. Keep asking. I would recommend keep asking how good can it get? Um, yeah. try to optimize a way out of the circumstance because it looks like you want to go that yeah. way, but something's not letting you do it. That's okay for right now. Yeah, thank you for that. And one thing I might add to it is to to always, when we have a choice to make or decision to make, to always check in with yourself inside so yes, you know, you've got all the, collect all the facts and information that you need, but but then check in with yourself, put it in your heart space, put it in your solar plexus chakra and just notice how it feels. You know, is there any tension? Is there any resistance? Or does it feel right? And, and listen to your intuition, basically. Yes. So 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I get into details on that in my book, Or Advantage, talking about listening to each of the parts of our body. That is so important. Listening mm-hmm. is pivotal. And we often don't listen to those levels of ourselves. Yeah. And There's meditation so is the key. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. We, we could have another whole podcast on that. On that. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Okay, Cynthia, so uh, could you now tell us uh, about your books, your services, your programs, your offerings? And obviously, I will include all the links in the show notes for people to contact you. So, but could you just tell us about it? Yes, the best way to stay in touch with me is check out my website, realityshifters.com. And sign up for the newsletter that's free. It comes out once a month. Don't share the mailing list. But I'm also on social media. So um, you can find me on YouTube, of course, and Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, so forth. And my books are available through Amazon.com. The mm-hmm. books that we've been talking about are Quantum Jumps and I brought up Or Advantage. Those happen to be the two books that have um, had some quantum jumps themselves or reality shifts to them. Interestingly, mm. very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my other books would be Reality Shifts, High Energy Money. I've got a young mm-hmm. adult novel, Karen Kimball and the Dreamweaver's Web. And I've got a meditation CD called Aura Healing Meditations. I do mm-hmm. I do work with clients one-on-one. Sometimes I do classes, workshops, and talks. So mm-hmm. all of that would be published and mentioned through my website, realityshifters.com. Beautiful. Well, we've covered quite a lot of ground here. (laughs) And as always, we've only barely scratched the surface. Would you like to add any additional thoughts or or comments or perhaps a summary, something you would like to leave our audience with? Ah, Just uh, to reemphasize the point that we are much more than we think we are. The situation and circumstances are, uh, there's much more going on than seems to be the case. So when we ask that question, how good can it get? We're inviting this newfound participation between a a greater sense of ourselves in participation with a greater possibility from the outside world. Thank you, Cynthia. Beautifully said. Well, thank you so much for jumping into quantum living. (laughs) It's been a, a terrific conversation and a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you, Anna. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.